Hey guys, welcome to the Line Mentality Podcast by Line Pro, where we talk to lineman people about lineman things. I'm Alex Linencole, aka Coach Linny, and today on the show we talk to Arthur L.A. Ray, who was a high school phenom. He had over 30 offers, a top-ranked O lineman, and he went to Michigan State and he finished his career at Fort Lewis College in Colorado and became a Division II All-American, all after being diagnosed with bone cancer and having to not walk for two years and fight through and overcome. So this is an incredible episode, um, really absolutely the best we've had so far. And I would encourage all of you parents, coaches, and players alike to watch the whole thing. There's a ton of gold in there. And uh, it was just really amazing to hear his story. So uh, make sure that you guys share this with your friends. Give us a like and a subscribe. Check us out on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. And without further ado, we'll roll the episode. Coach Arthur Ray, L.A. Ray, uh, thank you for joining us, man. Yeah, man, I'm glad to be on, man. Of course, love talking line play. I've seen what you've been doing. You know, I really like your work, and I, I think couldn't think of a better way for us to collab. Yeah, man, absolutely. Uh, for all you viewers out there, Coach L.A. here is going to be joining us hopefully somewhat regularly, and we're going to dig into the ins and outs of line play and then do some work together. But for today, I really wanted to, uh, for one, share your story because I think it's really great for any kid to hear, um, obviously, and then also uh, dig into your philosophy a little bit. And then also today I wanted to find out more about uh, your dream and vision as a coach and as a trainer uh, and for your business. So why don't we start with, uh, with where it all started. Tell us about your um, kind of upbringing background in football and school and life, uh, where you, you know, played ball and stuff up till the recruiting. Gotcha. Gotcha. All right. Well, uh, born and raised South side of Chicago, man, I grew up in a baseball family. You know, my, my dad was a ninth round draft pick by the uh, Pittsburgh Pirates and my little brother, he ended up uh, getting drafted by the St. Louis Cardinals out of high school. He's in the farm system now. So baseball family, you know, I had to choose the odd route though, the right route. But, uh, you know, I've uh, been playing ball since I was 13. First started playing in eighth grade. Um, and then I went to Mount Carmel High School. It's a pretty good high school in, in Illinois, you know, in terms of state championships and different things like that. Had a good career there. You know, um, my junior year started, got brought up to varsity my sophomore season. And uh, senior year, pretty much everything went how I wanted to. We ended up with 30 scholarship offers. You know, it was all state, all American, all of that. Played in the, uh, the offense defense bowl down in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. You know, I had Cam Newton as my quarterback. You know, Joe Hayden on that team, Carlos Dunlap, guys like that. You know, Rolando mm-hmm. McClain. You know, uh, so been around some good players. Uh, but I decided to commit to Michigan State. A week after I committed to Michigan State, I was diagnosed with bone cancer in my left leg. So I had to, my world was. Yeah, it was shook. It was shook. I was 17 years old. I didn't know what to do. You know, uh, my my career in terms of football was up in the air. You know, nobody thought I'd ever come back and play. And uh, just along my life, you know, I just was fighting for my life at that point. Started chemotherapy, took chemo for a year. You know, I had my initial cancer removal surgery. Uh, long story short, uh, Coach D'Antonio, great people down there at Michigan State, they kept me on scholarship. So that was, that was a good deal. I was on crushes for two years. I spent 25 months on crutches uh, between the span of 2007 and 2009. I had nine surgeries on my leg and uh, just other with dealing with the complications of having chemo. Anybody took chemotherapy, they know you put a, you got a port in your chest, you know, when you're taking the chemotherapy. And uh, it took me four years to return back to the football field. You know, a lot of, a lot of, a lot of long days, hard work, dedication, a lot of faith, man, a lot of faith. God got me through it. Kept me blessed. 2011, walked back onto the field at Michigan State for spring ball. You know, I, I pretty much did scout team all that season, just get my feet back underneath me. You know, like I said, nobody thought I'd ever get back to that point. So, you know, it was uh, it was good for me. Learning curve. I had to learn how to be a top-notch athlete again. Uh, 2012, I played in three games. Played against Florida Atlantic. I played against uh, Indiana. And I played against we – had, we played Akron that year on the schedule. So – Played in three games. I got my degree that December in 2012. I contacted the NCAA, and, uh, you know, they said because of everything I had went through, I had the chance to get earned two years of eligibility back. So I decided to go to middle of the mountains, Durango, Colorado, played in the RMAC, played in the RMAC down there for Fort Lewis College. You know, had two great seasons down there. 
you know, I faced some adversity while I was down there, but I had two good seasons. Ended up being a Division II All-American my last year down there. And, uh, you know, that's when that's what brought me to get my opportunity in the NFL for a little bit, signed undrafted with the Miami Dolphins and uh, spent about a year down there. You know, uh, it's crazy, crazy how, how, how one thing, you know, one day I could think everything's over and then, you know, just through determination, faith and everything, I still ended up where I wanted to be, man. So my time in the NFL was good, ended up getting cut, came home. So of course I was in limbo, like, like a lot of other players. I sat around my parents' basement for a little bit, trying to figure things out, figure out which route I wanted to go. And uh, so I started the Lyman Academy. You know, that started in, in, in literally the winter of 2015. You know, me being from Chicago and, uh, you know, it's seven on seven gurus all around, you know, not having anything substantial in terms of position work for the offensive linemen. You know, that was something that I saw a void and I feel like I create something special there, especially for the guys in the city of Chicago land area and the state of Illinois as a whole. You know, so I started doing that and I got into coaching. I was always the player that I'll never be a coach. I kept saying that now coaching is my passion. I plan on being a coach forever. You know, I plan on coaching for the rest of my life. I know I love it. You know, it's uh, football is still my sanctuary. It's the place where I find peace still. So, you know, uh, when I start, I started off with two guys uh, in my academy. And, you know, I start teaching them little things, little techniques. Once they start getting it, I just like, man, I'm, I'm enjoying this. I was an offensive line coach at De La Salle High School uh, two years ago. That was my first crack at coaching, having a room, having a group of guys to work with. I loved it, man. Loved it, loved every second of it. By the day I had to miss practice, I was, I was pissed. That's when I knew that I found my next passion, my next path. And uh, finished the season out there, went well. You know, uh, we had three all-conference players up front. You know, I turned a guy that, you know, all the other coaches laughed at me you know, before he played, turned him into an all-conference center. You know, it just was, it was good feeling for me, you know, not, not necessarily, you know, just their success on the field, but just, you know, for me being able to give them what the great things that I've learned and, you know, the things that allow me to be successful as well. You know, now I'm, I'm a head coach, head coach at Curie High School. It's a CPS school in Chicago on the Southwest side, man. And I'm, I'm, I'm very excited. You know, I got my own program. You know, we went through my first year this past year, went through a lot of bumps. But, uh, you know, put the culture in place, change the structure. You know, now um, just giving these guys opportunities to go in college. You know, that, that's, that's all I'm about. You know, I know down the road in terms of my career, you know, I'd love to move up, obviously, but I just love coaching ball, man. You know, I, I'll be somebody's offensive line coach for a long time, you know. So that's awesome. That, that's pretty much a lot. That's it about me. Wow. Wow. What a story, you know. Um, what's, what's amazing is that, you know, before, uh, today, you know, and, and this kind of came up quickly, us able to get on this, you know, we've, uh, we've, we've kind of talked on social media and stuff and uh, I've really enjoyed your videos and I've seen you, uh, you know, sharing some of my stuff too. And I appreciate that. And, uh, you know, I didn't know your story and it's so amazing, you know, that it could be a movie someday, you know, and to be <laughs> have 30 offers, I mean, that back in 2007, recruiting is different than it was today. I, I went through, I graduated 06, you know, and I had one offer and uh, committed to Oregon state, you know, and, and definitely kind of the opposite end of that story. Cause I was trying to, I was trying to get that, the, that one offer and it came and it was just, I, I feel like I got really lucky. Um, I'd like to hear more about that perspective, you know, even before the cancer, uh, just what it was like going through recruiting. Like, when did you get your first offer? When did you get your first like letter yeah. Uh, and if there's anything that stuck out, like how did you pick Michigan State? Just a little bit more, maybe 10 minutes into that world. No, I got you. Oh, recruiting was, man, it was, I, I was preparing for it. You know, I, I, uh, I, I knew at a young age that football was what I wanted to do. So I was obsessed, man, I was obsessed. I researched it. You know, all the guys before me in that 04, 03, you know, 05, 06 class, I'm, I'm watching them go through recruiting. And I'm like, okay, how can I? set myself up the best way so I'm in that position. I was like, okay, well, sophomore year, I need to at least try to get a little bit of varsity reps mm -hmm. so I can try to, you know, get my name in that hat. But, yeah, man, I uh, the recruiting started for me fairly early. Uh, my junior season, but my, my coach didn't show me anything. Like, I, I was getting mail. My coach never told us to the end of the year. So I had, like, mail from that January that mm -hmm. I've never seen. But, it, you know, thinking back on it, you know, uh, 
you know, it was it was something that it continued to motivate me, though, because I was always wondering, like, are people noticing me? Are they seeing me? You know, do I need to send my film out? What do I need to do? So, you know, I man, I, this back, I think me and you were the last age of the VHSs now. So mm-hmm. I, I was I was the guy on the on the team who put I put two VHS, two VHS uh, VCRs together on one TV and literally made my tape in the basement. And yep. I ended up making about 10 to 15 of my teammates film. You know, just that, that's how, you know, I was just so obsessed with the process. I wanted to see them win. You know, I mm-hmm. wanted to see the guys go through it. So uh, my recruiting started right after my junior season. We had lost the state championship game and uh, it was November. So I went through Christmas. I got some letters, got invited to some junior days. You know, I started really getting some interest. So after Christmas, it picked up. So January, I think it was like January 12th, I went up to NIU, Northern Illinois University. And uh, that was my first visit, first junior day. And, you know, that was my first time being in that type of environment. And, you know, the coaches just showed me love right off bat. The current head coach who is there now, Thomas Hammock, he was the running backs coach there then. And he recruited Chicago. He was all over me. You know, uh, went there. It was real good. And we went to a basketball game and Coach Novak, who was the head coach then, you know, he pulled me and my mom to the side at halftime of the basketball game and told me I had a full ride scholarship there. I just uh-huh. was like, wow. I, you know, I, it, was a, it was a dream come true. It was something that, you know, I have been working for and it was confirmation that, you know, I have been doing things the right way. Now, uh, what was your size? Mm-hmm. What was your size at the point? Oh, I was 6'3", and I was probably 285 then. Yeah, probably about 285 then, yep. What about your grades? My grades, I had a 3.0. Yeah, I was always solid. I was always solid academically. My my parents, I I got old school parents, man. They're on my ass, you know. (laughs) (laughs) So, you know, they ain't ain't let me shortchange too much. So, you know, it was it was all good, man. So after that, we went to a couple camps. You know, the, the, the Nike camp was different when we were coming out, you know, at the Nike camp. Shit, you'd be past setting and Jim Trestle's right there. Mm-hmm. It's literally 100 to 200 coaches. That's how I, I wish recruiting was like that. Now I think a lot more guys who sort of go under the radar would get evaluated like that, you know, because having the coaches have a chance to truly get out there and uh, do things like that, that's really when I got noticed. I went to the, went to the Nike camp, you know, that March at, at Ohio State, and, you know, I left there with about seven, eight offers, but it's easy then. The coaches see you in shorts, they get your height, weight, they get you moving around, they see you, you know, that they're, they're able to fully evaluate you, so, you know, that, that's really when my recruiting picked up, but uh, recruiting was different. Uh, cell phones were fairly new, you know, yeah, uh, yeah. I got cussed out by my, by my dad for having a high cell phone bill for all the text <laughs> messages coaches could send. I remember that. Mm-hmm. I remember that vividly, you know, yeah. te- texting me, um, and then um, going through it, man, uh, what, what narrowed it down is crazy. I ended my recruiting pretty fairly early. I was committed in June to Boston College. Now, now Boston mm-hmm. College, I, I think you remember Boston College back then, they were sending an offensive lineman first, second round, probably yep. like seven, eight years straight. They were yep. an old line factory. Yep. And then I, was, I, I really was infatuated with their, with their offensive line development, you know, around then. I played tackle in high school, but I knew I'd be an inside guy at the next level, you know, and uh, I really, I had a great relationship with Coach Don Horton, you know, God rest his soul, you know, he passed away. He, he, I know he'd be my number one mentor, you know, especially with me heading into the coaching realm now, you know, he was the offensive line coach at Boston College, and I, me and my mom, we got on a plane, and we flew out there. I had no idea how Boston was, but I loved the visit. You know, we uh we got off the plane and we literally got on the subway and it went all the way through the middle of the downtown Boston and we're just passing colleges. I was like, okay, this reminds me of Chicago a little bit. You know, mm-hmm. right off the water. You know, so for a guy like me, I'm a city kid. So being in the, you know having that city type of urban environment, you know, it was it was it was good. It felt right. I had a good visit and I committed to them. So I was committed to them throughout my season. Now, of course, some coaches still stay in contact. They still try to recruit you. Um, UCLA came in late and I was really intrigued by that. Like, yeah, I was really <laughs> intrigued. I was like, man, that, that might be a visit I want to go on. But, uh, you know, I ended up coach Horton and coach O'Brien. I found out in the basement, in the basement on December, like right before Christmas, me and my dad just watching ESPN, probably a basketball game or something on the bottom ticker. Mm. Breaking news, Tom O'Brien resigns as Boston College head coach. I'm like, wow. So I'm mm. calling, 
you know, I'm, I'm, I'm calling all the coaches that turn their phones in. Nobody's answering. I didn't know what was going on. Like that mm-hmm. was probably my, that was, that was a, a real crazy time. And then uh, I think they, they gave the job to, uh, to the, the offensive coordinator and the offensive line coach of the Green Bay Packers at that time. They gave him the Boston College job. But I hadn't talked to anybody in about two weeks. So, you know, I'm a kid. I'm not I'm, – I'm like, whoa, what's going on? So I ended up getting on Rivals.com, a uh, guy by the name of Edgy Tim who runs our rivals in Illinois, and I just told him to just tell everybody my recruiting's open. I'm decommitting. So I decommitted from, uh, from Boston College. And then, of course, Coach Horton and Coach O'Brien, they take over at NC State, and they call me the next day and then offer me there. And I was like, okay. Mm-hmm. So they took over at North Carolina State. And then uh, a guy by the name of Danny Roshar and, and Coach D'Antonio, they just got the job at Michigan State. So it was, it was perfect time. You know, Coach Roshar, he, uh, he, he recruited Chicago, and one of his friends uh, was a Mount Carmel guy. So he sent his film, sent my film to Michigan State. Coach Roshar came to Chicago like the next day. So he sat down with me, man, and, uh, and I, had, I had a real good time with him, real good feel for him. Ended up going up to visit Michigan State, sat down there, loved the campus. Michigan State is, is – uh, Michigan State is, is, is nice now. You know, 50,000 students is beautiful. It's big. You know, it, it, they got everything you want in terms of off the field. You know, I was loving that. I thoroughly enjoyed my visit. Yeah. <laughs> right? So – That's awesome. So, you know, uh, sat with Roshar, and the first thing he does, he's like, well, how do you feel about playing center? And I'm like, what? And he puts on, like, some – some fucking 1995 Olin Krutz film. Mm. And it's it just the Bears working combos, working insides on steps, snapping and step, and just all the little things. And we, we watched it for about 30 minutes, and I'm just like, yeah. Yeah, I'm mm-hmm. like, I want all of that. You know, I, I wanted all of that. So I ended up committing to them probably about two weeks after the visit just to, you know, to make sure I covered all bases. And, and uh, it worked out well, man. Recruiting, recruiting for me was – um. It was pretty fun. I mean, I know now being on the other side of it as a coach and watching just the new wave with social media and how everything's expedited now. Because I'm, mm-hmm. you know, I, I got a player right now with uh, with thirty offers, so he's an offensive mm-hmm. line, and I'm seeing everybody try to force him into committing. And you know, they they can't pull the old tricks on me because you know, <laughs> you know <laughs> we went through it. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So it's just like the coaches they come visit us at the school, and you know, I keep it pretty honest with them because I, I understand how it goes, but you know, for the, for the kids, it's, it's good, man. But recruiting, recruiting's good. It's just, it's a lot of information. I wish I knew back then before, as I went through navigating through it, like I know now, but I think that uh, for a first timer, which a lot of people are when they go through this and you, you don't got too much knowledge, I think it went fairly well. Yeah, no, that's amazing. So cool. And then, so you sign yep. and you're getting ready to go. Everything's great. Yep. And then what you felt the pain in your leg yeah i had so, so after the all american game in january i had a lump on my shin i actually had the same lump throughout the playoffs like that november so i had so the the tumor was growing on my shin since november of 2006 as we're going making our playoff run mm-hmm. i just noticed that it didn't start bothering me until the february like the end of january february i'm like man i got a sharp pain in my leg and you know so, you know, of course, the doctors, they thought it was a hematoma at first. They're doing all these scans, x-rays, bone scans. And they're like, oh, no, it's nothing. It's a chip bone uh, fracture, stress fracture. I've heard it all, man. Right, when I tell you I've heard it all, I've heard it all. Mm-hmm. I ended up getting a biopsy, and the biopsy came back. It was, a, it was a bone tumor. It was an osteosarcoma, and they changed my life forever. What was that? March, April? Was that right? That was, right that before was you? Literally, literally a week after signing day. So wow. it was very still. Yeah. Wow. Was literally. Wow. And I was I was tore up, man. I uh, my first visit to the doctor wasn't good. You know that that guy. Uh, he he pretty much told me. He said, "Yeah, you know, uh, you, you'll never play football again. You you barely probably walk. Barely, you probably barely be able to move around with your grandkids. You know, I'm 17 years old and my grandkids." What? Mm. Well, you know, yeah, yeah, you know, it just was, it was a, it was a complete redirect. You know, it was life altering in terms of me mentally as well. But uh, yeah, man, it's all you know. That, that looking back on it now, and and uh, the things I've been able to overcome, you know, it's it's all all for the better for now. Yeah, and besides, you know, faith. What's been what's been the key 
that's uh, that's allowed you to always, you know, come out on top in, in these type of situations? Man, uh, understanding how to channel my energy, you know, mm-hmm. yeah, man, I, I was I was a young kid. I was mad at the fucking world, you know. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, mm-hmm. you know, I was mm-hmm. right. And I'm I I'm the football was such a sanctuary for me. It was such a okay. Somebody's bothering me in the real world. All right, let me go put this helmet on. Give it to somebody else. Right, we in practice. Mm-hmm. You know, <laughs> to get it off me a little bit, you know, without having that. You know, I, I had a lot of anger that was that you know, was in me. It was just it was contained. I was holding on to it. And you know, me being young and not really being able to recognize my emotions at the time, you know, I, I channeled it the wrong way a lot of times, man. I really did. You know, I, I sat down, it's crazy, because uh I, I sat down at Michigan State, I was so upset one time, you know, they that they forced me to sit down with a psychiatrist. And I, I was a little reluctant to it, you know, just that, you know, just coming from, I'm a football player. I'm a tough guy. I don't need to talk to anybody about my, you know what I'm saying, man? Mm-hmm, just mm-hmm. just being, being that young, you know, I wasn't open to it, but I talked to a guy, man. And he just, he just told me one thing that, that changed my life forever. He told me, uh, he said, you real angry. I said, yeah, you think, you know, <laughs> yeah, it was like a 20 minute conversation. I said, yeah, I'm 17. I got bone cancer. Well, I, who wouldn't be angry? You know, I'm sitting there barking at him. I'm going, I'm going right at him, you know, because I, I don't know who this guy is. He's an old guy, got a gray, gray afro, gray beard. He just, you know, and I'm, I'm just sitting here like, why am I even here? He just was like, you know, how about, how about you channel all of that energy, all of that anger, all of that pain into the things that get you better, into rehab, into the weight room and so workouts you can control that you can control your attitude when it comes to those things that it gets you ultimately to where you want to go it's going to be tough but if you focus on that and you focus your energy on that then you'll be better then i he got up and left and i was like yeah i'm never going to one of those fucking (laughs) (laughs) right you know what i'm saying so but i i took it i took it to heart man and uh i was better for it i i i heard him you know, I ain't want to listen to him at that point, but I heard him and I, and I took it and I, man, I attacked, I attacked my, my upper body got as strong as I ever could get. You know, I was, I went from benching the 225 you know, to just throwing, throwing 405. Now I'm, now I'm, I'm getting, I'm getting my strength back and getting my confidence back. You know, I, I, I couldn't walk for two years. So, you know, I'm in the pool, we're in the, the wave pool, you know, working full body, getting my leg strength back, you know, on the elliptical, doing little things, just, mm-hmm. just you know, I'm boxing, you know, boxing training at the Michigan State, our, our equipment manager, he was an ex-pro boxer. I love doing that. You know, I just was, I was finding things to, to get it off me, get that, get that negative energy off me. I kept, it kept me sane, man, kept me, kept me positive when it, when it felt like everything was building up. I really truly believe that. Mm. That's amazing. What would you say, let's say, uh, I mean, there's probably kids out there, you know, and, and, and there probably there's guys who might be going through something similar. Maybe, yep. maybe they uh, got sick and lost their spot. You know, I know personally guys that that's yep. happened to maybe guys, uh, the recruiting's not going the way they wanted. Um, school's not going the way they wanted. Maybe they got broken up with just, you know, mm-hmm. by a girl, but today yep. it, it seems that there's a lot of teenage you know, big boys who get down and you know, it's, it's it, when you're young, it's so hard. Like you said, it's so hard to really know what your emotions are and, and mm-hmm. see the bigger picture. So now as a 30 year old, 31 year old, what do you say to a kid who might be going through something like that, whether it's a life threatening disease or even just something simple that, uh, that has them down? Man, this is, man, as a head coach, I deal with it on a daily. And, you know, it's just the, the ups and downs of life. You know, I sit down and I, I, I'm honest with them, man. You know, and I think that's why they get me. You know, I think that, that, that a lot of times when we grow up, sort of, we don't, we, 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 we lose sight of who we were when we were that young. You know what I'm saying? So I, mm-hmm. I, th- I try to put myself in their shoes. And even when they're dealing with things now, man, I, I try to, I try to give them perspective. That, that's a good word for it. Just try to allow them to see it differently. Because mm-hmm. you know, they, 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 of course, when you're down, you want to sit in it and you see it your way and your way is negative and it's never can't be seen as negative. So really, I try to change the course of their perspective. I don't really try to, I don't really want them to sit in it, you know, because I know they can, it can, sometimes it can overwhelm people. You know, we yep. call that depression. 
call mm-hmm. that, you know, that right. That's when the when it when it gets bad, when it mm-hmm. anxiety, you know, then it, it it escalates to something else where you really think you're something's wrong with you. So, you know, I try to I try to teach them the same tools that that allowed me to be successful, whatever makes them happy, whether that's playing the video game. Whether that's you know these kids nowadays, whether that's posting some, get them a thousand likes, you know, I just, <laughs> right, right. Yeah. So you know, just just to do things and keep people around them that sort of get their mind off of it. That was the biggest thing for me. You know, being at Michigan State was tough. Yeah, I get it. It was tough. I was a high level athlete. Now I'm crushing into the meeting room. I'm on the bike watching practice. And then, you know, you, you got players that they recruited after me. They're walking past me like, who's this guy? He's the hurt guy. He's not shit. You know, and, that, and that's going through my – I feel like everybody who walks past me and looks at me, they're looking at me pitifully. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I took it. And I took it that way. You know, mm-hmm. right? yeah, I really mm-hmm. took it personally. You know, which, which I think that, you know, that aided in getting me back healthy because maybe that was the push I needed. I needed yeah. that. I needed somebody to light a fire, you know, underneath me. So it's just that um, I try to teach them to not look at life so negatively. It's a lot of things we can all be upset about, but perspective and the, sort of the view of it, even in a bad situation, the situation you feel like you're helpless, you're really not. It's certain things within yourself that you can take a step on and start doing. And Absolutely. I, yeah, man, it, it, it's been going good. You know, I, I consider myself a, a mentor of young men, and, and you know, that, that's one part of this coaching deal that I enjoy. Yep. And one thing, you know, can add to that for anybody out there who maybe is down, down lately, something big happened. Um, you know, just, just look at coach LA, you know, it doesn't get much worse than that. And I'm sure you never would have imagined that you'd be the guy that you are today, you know, and partly because of that. So whatever the situation is, whether it's you've lost somebody or, you know, things aren't looking great or you have some sort of even a diagnosis like that, try to see how it's going to help form you into the person you're going to be and how it'll someday empower you to help other people to share your story and just see things from a 10 year view, 20 year view. Cause if you could go back and talk to yourself at your deepest, darkest moment uh, during that, you know, it'd be, you know, you, it would be a lot different of a person than you were back then talking to you, you know? So yeah. I think it's huge for you to be able to get on and, t- and tell your story there. So I really appreciate that. And I think to, um, to carry forward then, I'd like to hear a little bit about what it was like going from Michigan State, D1A, you know, Big Ten, right? Or Big 12? Your Big Ten. Big yep. Ten, mm-hmm. you know, 100,000 fans mm-hmm. down to Fort Lewis College <laughs> uh, in yep. terms of amenities and situation when it came to like football, the atmosphere, mm-hmm. uh, the team atmosphere, and the, the competition, the, the playing. Yeah, well, just, man uh... – uh, I'll, I'll start with atmosphere, man. You go from 75,000, you go from East Lansing, Michigan, go green, go white. It is rocking. It's rocking. That's how I describe it. Michigan State is a true college town, and they love them some football, love sports in general. Of course, our basketball team with our success as well as our other sports. Just, um, you know, going from that and seeing it at a high level and, and the expectations, they expect you to do well every week. And the, the pressure. And, you know, of course, the perks of being a Division One athlete, you know, yeah. all the gear, you know, training table, different things of that nature, just, you know, you're pretty, pretty much taken care of. You're taken care of now, you know, they, they treat you well. Yep. So going to Fort Lewis, for me personally, was perfect. No one knew me. It was mm. perfect. No one knew me. I, I, didn't, I didn't. Yeah, I didn't have to be. I didn't have to be, oh, Arthur Ray, that's the guy who battled back from cancer. That's the guy who was on mm-hmm. crutches for two years. I could, I could fade away and turn myself into Arthur Ray, a fucking football player. Yeah. Yeah, you oh. see what I'm saying? So, yep. yeah, so it was beginning. beautiful. Mm-hmm. It was beautiful for me. Mm-hmm. It was beautiful. The mountains were beautiful. I'm a city kid. I'd never seen mountains in my life. Yeah. I've, I've never been outside and they've been so quiet. You yeah. know, I'm used, to, I'm used to things moving, you know, being mm-hmm. a South Sider. So, you know, it was, it was perfect for me, the – the stillness, the calmness, football almost, football almost only mattered to me and them 80 guys in the locker room. We probably had the, the most amount of fans we probably have, maybe five, 600 on a good day. You know what I'm saying? Like, mm-hmm. and, and that was all right for me. Uh, you know, I was back playing the game I loved. I, and I was like, I can showcase myself now, you regardless. Um, so it was, atmospheres were totally, uh, total, total 180, you know, a completely different story. 
you know, it was, uh, it was, it was, it was different in certain points where I think a lot of guys would have failed, but I enjoyed it. I, I enjoyed just being a guy walking into town. They don't know if I'm a football player. They don't, you know, they don't know anything. I sort yeah. of beat my own drum and it was good. Uh, in terms of competition level, like I tell all guys, I earn so much respect for the lower levels of football. Mm. Like I like division two football, division three, people can say what they want. Yeah. Guys can ball. Yeah. Like, yeah, there's guys yeah. that can ball down there now. They might be a little bit shorter, maybe a tad bit uh, slower, different things like that. Maybe not phys- – they don't got the physical traits that you're used to. You know, you see sure. – you walk on a Big Ten field or an SEC field, you're like, whoa, right. that's a grown right. man. <laughs> yeah, right, yeah. you know. Yeah. That, that might be the difference. But the, in terms of football skill level and talent level, oh, it's there. Yeah. It's there, especially in the RMAC. You know, we play teams like uh, – CSU Pueblo, they're in the Division II national title game at least once every couple years. Always a consistent in the playoffs. I think that year, back in uh, 2014, you know, 2014, 2015, they had about four guys go undrafted. You know, and they, they get D1 bounce backs every year. I tell them it's a different level of football. That's what I think. I love that perspective. I can apply it to my high school players. Who, yeah. When I was in high school and you don't hear about a D2, you're like, they play football there. Right. You know, what is what is Minnesota State Mankato? What is that? You know, you just, it's not that you're you know you're trying to talk about them. You just don't know. Yeah. It's not visual, so you don't know. I'm able to offer that insight to my guys now. I'm able to tell Huge. them like, hey, no, that's a that's a that's a team now. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they're D two, but that's a team. They invest a lot in the football. You're going to get treated damn near like a D one FCS athlete if you yeah. go there. You see what I'm saying? So that's it's huge. just uh yeah, it's a the, the competition gap. I don't think it's that big. I think it's more of a size, physical traits, and just uh, like when you think of D1 ball, when them guys hop off the bus, you're like, yeah, that's a ball player. Yeah. Yeah. Right? yeah. <laughs> right. Absolutely. Yeah. And I know for me, I mean, I was constantly outclassed physically in the mm-hmm. Pac 10, and now it's the Pac 12. Uh, I was, I, it was an uphill battle from day mm-hmm. one. You know, scout team every day was an uphill battle. Uh, every game other than our non conference, you know, D1 AA games. I never felt dominant. I was always right. sur- surviving and doing my best mm-hmm. and loving it, but also in some ways hating that, you know, like I was came from a high school where I was able to push guys around at my heart's will. Mm-hmm. So when I deal with kids who, you know, cause every six foot, six foot one, five eleven guy that, that comes through and especially here in the state of Oregon, mm-hmm. I'm going to prove them wrong. I'm going to, yep. I'm going to make it D one. And for the little guy, you were a little guy, tell me how to do it. And I'm like, in 2019, go play Division Two, yep. go play Division Three, mm-hmm. and have the time of your life because yep. you do not want to get you don't want to be a 21 year old, five, a six foot one guy or a six foot guy, mm-hmm. uh, having to go daily against these five star, uh, you know, six six, three thirty mm-hmm. guys, right. and surviving. Go have some fun, you know. Go yeah. knock some heads. Yeah. And uh, and so then you so you had some success in that way, didn't you? Yeah, I had a lot of success at, at Fort Lewis, man. And then just being able to play the game, that's what you truly enjoy. I think the mm-hmm. kids get, get too caught up in the hoopla, especially yep. the way recruiting's going. Yep. You know, they, 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 just, they get too caught up in, in, in that, and it, it discourages them, which it shouldn't. It should motivate. Yep. And then when I, this, is, this is what kills all, every kid's argument. I mean, like you guys think that you guys think the NFL is made up of Division I monsters, SEC monsters, Big Ten monsters. It's really mm-hmm. not. When you yep. get on those teams, when you get on those teams, these guys are from all over. Yep. It has to be a record number of small school guys in the NFL right now that are making contributions and are playing in balling. Of yep. course, you're going to – I say, yeah, of course, the Big Ten SEC guy, they'll go first round, second round, stuff like that. But after that, look at this. Watch the small school guys fly off the board. Yep. People are evaluating football all over. I said, they pay these guys too much to not find you. That's mm-hmm. what I tell my players. Mm-hmm. If you're worried about the next level, they pay them too much to not find you. That yeah. guy doesn't find you, his ass is fired. That's just how it goes. That's right. Yeah. You know, they're on, the, they're on the road consistently. So just, you know, talking to that and giving my guys that perspective, man, it, it is great. Because I, I love lower-level football. I think it doesn't get the amount of respect that it deserves. But I understand why, you know, for in some cases. Of course, D1, everybody wants to be the best. Everybody wants to play at the mecca. And I think that – with the younger guys, they let that play into their psyche a little bit more than I'd like. So I try yeah. to, I try to correct that as much as I can. That's huge. I think that's phenomenal. 
And, uh, you know, out here on the West Coast, there's definitely a lack of knowledge about the smaller school stuff. So I really think uh, that message is something I'm always wanting to get out there. You know, I think in 2019, I for sure would have been a smaller school guy because uh, I'm not quite 6'2". And just overall athleticism and everything, I, I was pretty lucky. There was a lot of guys like me who didn't make it uh, to D1 and had a good time playing Division II, right. uh, Division I AA. And, and, and so anyways, uh, point being, you know, the kids out there, it's, it's don't be D1 or bust, right? Uh, right? Consider what's out there. You've got so many tools now to find those guys. Um, and then another thing that I think is interesting is that you didn't start getting contacted until like your junior season after your junior season. Mm -hmm. Myself, I didn't get a letter till after my junior season. I'm seeing a lot of freshmen and sophomores and their parents uh, kind of spaz out in a way, um, doing so much showcasing as freshmen and sophomores. Yep. And I actually have a guy who, you know, he was overweight. He's, he's really, really talented, huge potential. Yep. Uh, even good film, but he would play it at 365. And I really believe, because he's now, he's worked himself down to 320 and he looks amazing. I believe if nobody would have seen him until now that he'd have more offers, but he's just starting to get on the radar. Uh, and I think that at the highest level, they've made their kind of judgment early. Mm -hmm. Like you only get one first impression. That's the same, right? So my message lately to the young guys has been whatever energy you think you need to pour into recruiting, Pour into your ability, your flexibility, your strength, your training, your knowledge of the game, because there's nothing more important than your junior film when it comes to the coaches watching. If you have a really great junior film and you get all conference, they're going to watch that tape, yep. right? No showcase, no uh, junior day or sophomore day or whatever is going gonna, is gonna to do it for you. Uh, especially if you don't have the film at that point, you know, some right. of these guys don't have tape. Right. So it's like, what are you trying to do now? The one benefit, the experience of being in front of coaches, the experience of being out there. But, uh, but I think, you know, I mean, we're in very similar positions, just mm -hmm. working with kids. And yeah. uh, so I think it's an important message for them. Get your body right. No, it's huge, man. Especially the game has changed. Like the, the, the time of the 6'5", 360-pound mauler O-lineman, they are gone. Mm -hmm. It is obsolete. That is a dinosaur in this game of football now. Like, they ankle flexion, ankle flexibility, knee flexibility, the ability to bend, the ability to run your feet through contact. Like, they are looking for big athletes. Like, yep. yeah, they yep. are, so the game, the game has changed now. Dealing with the younger guys, though, yeah, man, you know, sometimes the parents are, the parents are unbelievable. And mm -hmm. it's always a parent that, you know, I hate to say it, it's always a parent that doesn't have the, the sort of a, the greatest sports background. But mm -hmm. you know what? I, I, I try not to hold it against them. It's yeah. just a lack, of, it's a lack of knowledge. That's what it is. Yep. They see things or they see other people getting things. Why isn't my son getting that? You know, it's just a lot, of, yep. a lot of that type of deal. You know, of course, nowadays, these kids are coming out a little bigger now. now yeah. Nowadays, you might have your random 6'6", six, six, 250 pound 14 year old kid yep, yep. and then and then the, the, now the other 14 year old family who has a 5 11 uh 215 pound guard you know uh that's a that that's that's 14 they're like oh well how'd that kid get it my kid's 14 he's just as good you know so yep. it's just a sort of a painting the picture for them and letting yeah. them letting them understand recruiting is not fair yeah, but, <laughs> yeah recruiting that's is true. not and recruiting is not an exact science if anybody tells you that, hey, I'm going to guarantee you that Notre Dame recruits your son. No, you can't. No. Nope. I got a kid who got 30 offers right now, and I've had about five or six schools that walk in there, yeah, he doesn't fit our height properly, or you know, <laughs> he doesn't. Um, he's not as tall as I'd like him, coach. And you know, I'm like, okay, man. All right. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Well, the, other, the other 20 schools who love him, love him. So, yep. you know, thanks, coach. Thanks for the opportunity. And you just never know, you know. Uh, mm -hmm. My, my dad used to say this all the time, and I never fully understood it until I got older. He says, sports are subjective. That means it's based on another man's opinion. Mm. And I ne that never registered until I got older. Like he said, it's like one of those old wise guys saying, I'm like, all right, dad, whatever. You yeah. know, right? you know <laughs> what I'm saying? But it, you know, now that it, it's so true. That is the truth. You know, based on if, if me, if myself and you become college offensive line coaches, we know what we want. Right. When we turn on that tape, we want to, we, it's certain things. It's like, yeah, I, he got to do this. Right. 
we, we might not. And, and of course, just us with our backgrounds, we're not going to be height guys. We're not going to be strung up on height. You know, of course, we want the guys that look the part. But, yep. you know, it's, it's, it's certain guys. Parents need to understand that. It's certain yep. guys. If yep. he's not a certain height, they're not going to recruit him. Like some schools, they don't even want to watch his film. Like yep. they don't care how good he is. And then there's some schools that recruit ball players. Yep. Yeah, he's a little two inches short to turn his tape on. Oh, I like him. He got the speed to make it up, blah, blah, blah. You know, they go down their evaluation. But, you know, I just think it's a – they. I think the parents think it's an exact science. If you do this, if you do that, if you do this, you go to this camp, you pay this guy, you pay this recruiting guru, oh, you go to Florida State. You see what I'm saying? Right, so, yeah, right. and, and, and it's, it's, it's really not like that. You know, everybody's yeah. recruiting is different. And, you know, it's a lot about timing. The really the real thing that I think is recruiting is so sped up now compared to when we were getting recruited. It mm-hmm. is sped up now. Like my like my, my kid on my team, he's planning official visits now. And I'm like, why are you you know, I'm like, why are you taking official visits? But I get it. He wants to make a decision before the season starts and this December signing period forces everybody's hand. So now the yeah. coaches now the coaches are calling them and they're like, Oh yeah, we know we might fill up. Uh, come check us out. And I'm like, well, go check them out. You like them. You know, I ain't, I, yeah, I'm not yeah. going to hold you back. But I just, you know, because when I think of an official visit, I think of a weekend of college atmosphere. I want to mm-hmm. see everything. I want to see how the girls look. I want to see the, the, the cafeteria, the calves. They got the best food. I want, you know, I'll write. <laughs> I want to see the, the diversity of the campus. I yep. want to see where, the, where the, the, the building that I think I'm going to major in, I want to see how that looks. How yep. that, the class, I want to get the full feel. I want to en- envision myself here in the next four to five years. You know, I want to sit here and, like, this is someplace where I can grow, where I can become a man. You know, I think that um, it's, it's just so sped up, man, that the parents yeah. got to really do their research. The kids got to do a lot of research. Yeah, that's huge right there because you talk about factors in picking a school. Mm-hmm. Uh, a lot of guys go off of the coaching staff and a lot of guys go off of the roster. Right. And, you know, you and I both learned that those things can change and they probably will. Yeah. But, but there's a lot of factors you can look for and a lot of guys miss mm-hmm. that don't have so much to do with that. And I think that's a really great point you made there as far as, you know, opening up your eyes to the width of the evaluation that you can make. No, um, of course. And that's yeah. why, you know, I, I talk to my guys about relationships. Life is about relationships. I say, you know what, because I'm at a high school that they're not used to what I'm doing. They're not used to a college coach walking in there every single day. They're so not used to it. You know, they question me about it, which is crazy. But, you know, but, you know, life is life. So it's just, yeah. it's just like understanding the relationships. Like when that, when that Division three coach comes in here from Carthage in Wisconsin and he walks in, he's like, hey, hey, Alex, hey, hey, great to meet you. Hey, coach, you know, Coach Ray told me a lot of good things about you. And you're sitting there like – uh, yeah, man, I ain't trying to go to Carthage. Uh, yeah, whatever. Thanks, Coach. Thanks for stopping by, Coach. Whatever. And, and, and they feel that mm-hmm. because you can blink, and that coach from Carthage is Michigan State's coach. You know, you, the, the way this coaching tree works, you know, you, I always talk to my guys about not burning bridges yep. and, not, and representing themselves well at all times because you never know. You can blink, and that, that coach that you just blew off is at your dream school. Now he doesn't want anything to do with you. Because you know you, because you had the, you wanted to disrespect them, or your dad got on the phone like, "Oh, my son ain't going to play for no Carthage," you know, and, and you just mm-hmm. and and you miss the entire point of how yep. this goes. Because now you you know how this goes. Once you become a college coach, it's just a cycle. You know, guys get fired, you get hired because you were good to that guy, you were good to this guy. He invites you over here to come coach with me. You know, right, once, once, once we're at that point and we're in it, like, oh, yeah, that's where you question. Oh, I'm at Oregon. Oh, okay, I'm in Miami. Then, boom, oh, yeah, now, now we're at Boston College. Now, oh, okay, now I'm at Georgia. Yep. It's just, yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, you know, mm-hmm. so it's just, the, you know, I think that um, people just got to understand, you know, the power and the value of relationships and the whole deal. You know, I yep. think that gets missed. I think, oh, it, yeah, yeah that, that gets missed. And I think that, of course, it's a selfishness when you're getting recruited, which you should. In some cases, because it's your future. But at the same time, think of the bigger picture, too. Yep, absolutely. And on the note, thinking about, you know, parents and kids and recruiting, um, you know, one thing you mentioned was was before recruiting started for you, you knew what you wanted to do. You set your intention, Mm -hmm. right? 
You said, okay, I'm watching how it goes for these guys. I had a similar thing. There was a lineman and a prolific skill guy, a receiver who went through recruiting and I did, I wasn't close enough. I was still eighth grade, you know, but my brother was older. He was their age and got to watch some of that. My brother was also a baseball guy, okay. uh, played at Wake Forest. Okay. And, okay. Uh, yeah. and so anyways, and he's, he's two years older. Uh, for one year, I got to be a guard. He was a quarterback, so that was kind of cool. Right. Uh, we could play together. But anyways, um, what I see is because you th- you're talking about a 12-year-old who's mm-hmm. in just 36 months. Now he's 15, right? right. 36 months later, he's 18. So right. there has to be a growth. And in, the, in today's recruiting world, being a business now, the parents are very prone to take over and just run with it. Yeah. And saying, I got to get my 13, 14, 15 year old seen. I mean, I see, I see 12 year olds getting put all over social media with an intent by the parents to make, make a business of it. And it's not yeah. that it's, that it's, that it can't work. But the thing is that what I worry about is that the kid, it has to start and end in the heart of the kid. Mm-hmm. And when I was a child, I was drawing pictures of myself playing for Nebraska and playing for the Packers mm-hmm. and being an O lineman. Like I was eating up anything I could get. And my, and my dad fed it. You know, he gave me books about combine prep I could read and he put me in front of trainers and stuff, you know, and, and, and got me prepared, but we didn't go off trying to market me until I was marketable. Right. And when we did, you know, he did a fair amount of talking and, and, and at times I thought maybe it was too much. I was a kid. Right. I didn't, I didn't know in retrospect, you know, kids out there absolutely respect the parents because at the end of the day, they want what's best for you. But yep. parents, let the kid do some talking. Make sure that he's stepping into it. And if he's not, if he's being shy, maybe he doesn't want it. You know, maybe he doesn't want to be there because I, I, you know, you and I both probably see a lot of kids come in the door and it's hard to work with them because they, you can tell they don't want it. Mm-hmm. But the kids that do want it are the kids that end up like you and I and finding their way to a, a cup of tea in the NFL. Yep. Because that le- just a little bit of want mixed with a little bit of success leads to more want, more success. And we see that now as trainers. And so my message, and I think this really is drawn from everything you said, is that the kid has to want it more than the parent and they have to dream about it and they can't be shy to dream about it. And they have to start believing themselves at some point and lean into it. Sh- learn how to shake a coach's hand, look him in the eye. Yep. And, and really, you know, if, for any kid listening, just try to picture yourself when you're our age and right. listen to the way we talk about ourselves when we were your age. We were uncertain, unsure, you know, whatever, but we knew in our hearts that we wanted to make every day count towards this mm-hmm. goal. So if you're too self unsure to set a goal and go after it, you know, take a deep look and, and try to imagine a conversation with your 30 year old self and imagine that person being like us and you can just, can just be us right here. But the message is believe in yourself, yep. but don't be cocky. You, mm-hmm. you, well, two things, believe in yourself and put the work in and be willing to play wherever you're wanted based on you and your skill and your situation. Cause if you're not, if you're the guy that, is too cool to, to go to division two and your ego has you hell bent on D one. Yep. It's not going to happen. You got to be willing to do whatever's needed to go wherever you're wanted. Yeah, no, I will hundred percent agree with you. And when you make the point about being cocky, it's like be cocky enough to think you can do it, but be humble enough to go to fucking work, go to Boom. work, Boom. go to that. work. Love you know, it. I that man, and it, and and you're right, and it, because it's it, it's and I, you man, you're preaching to the choir right now because it's I got, I got about seven or eight guys that I think can make it. They got talent. They can make mm-hmm. it. They're going into their senior year, this 2020 class. And my one guy, my top dog, who got who got his 30 offers and everything. You know, it's he's separated by his intention. He wants it more than anything, and you can tell like he doesn't miss a day. You know, it's him, and then it's another guy. And, and the other guy I'm talking about, he's a little shorter than what they want. He's picked mm-hmm. up some D1 offers, but I know if he was 6'4", he'd blow up. Those two guys, they, are, they don't miss days. Mm. They don't miss weight room days. They don't miss, they don't miss chalk talk day. They're always, coach, um, if I'm a miss, uh, I just told my mom I'm canceling. I'm going to practice. I'm coming to practice. They yep. don't, you know, they, they want it. Like and you, like you said, That's we it. played at a high level so we can smell it on a guy who wants it. Mm-hmm. And then it's other guys who like, 
yeah, getting a scholarship sounds good, coach, but you know, right. I'm, I'm going to go hang out with my girlfriend. I'm gonna Maybe go. if it happens. I'll play D1 if it happens. If, right. You know, it, it, right. It, it, is, it is crazy because that drives me insane. Mm. It, it really does because it's just like, you know, I, I know how passionate I am about the game. So when I'm around guys who don't care like that, it almost bothers me. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah, mm-hmm. I'm almost like, come on, man, why, why are you playing this? You know, yeah. you're not gonna if you're not gonna put your all into it. The game can be so great for you. I mean, even if you just want to go to college and get a free education, college is expensive. Like yeah. just just get your college paid for. Yeah, like, that, just just care about it enough to do that. You know, absolutely. Yeah, you know. So I I, I agree with you 100. percent I think that desire has to outweigh everything because that's when I when I when people talk to me about how did I overcome you know my leg pains? How did I overcome? You know, I had to I had to wear a special brace over my leg, which Even made at, at, at uh, Fort Lewis. Yeah, which made bending for me a little tough. You know, yeah. what I mean? and 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 I know how important knee bend and everything is. So for the next level, so I'm like, man, shit, I better learn how to bend with this brace. My mm-hmm. desire for being great overcame my circumstance. You know, and that's what that's what you don't see with a lot of the kids, man. And that's what you know you 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 sort of find you try to find triggers. You're like, what's gonna push them? But I know me, you know, I'm not the, I'm not the, hey, that's a great job, kid. I'm not, I'm the, you know, that's, no, do it again. No, you can do better. I'm on, yeah. I'm on, them. I'm on their ass, man, because I know how tough where they want to go is going to be. So I'd be doing them a disservice if I coddle them. Everybody else is coddling them. You know, yeah, everybody, let, let mom, let mom coddle you. Let mom tell you you're beautiful, you're great, you're the, you're the greatest quarterback since Willie Bean. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> right. So, you know, let, let, let them get that from outside ears. I'm going to tell them the truth and I'm going to make them go earn it, you know, because I, I think that, you know, them trying to – having to develop that type of mindset, you know, when you're dealing with an overbearing parent, I think the parent, it's a, it comes to a point where they got to let them go. Mm-hmm. They can't go play the game for their son. Mm-hmm. My, my dad used to sit in the stands – at the field in Chicago and talk all types of shit. Cause he knew I loved it enough. I'm going to destroy everybody. You know, yeah. <laughs> I, loved, I wasn't going to lose, you know, that just, that was how I thought in high school. I'm not losing nobody. I want this. I'm going to the NFL. Boom, boom, boom. You know? So it's just like those parents were overbearing. They're like, no, my son's going to do this. My son's going to do this. Then their son jogs out there and they don't want it. Yeah. It's it, right. And yeah. it's like that, that has to be so demoralizing for the parent too. Mm-hmm. The parents up there are like, wow, I thought he you know, no, you cared. You got and like you said, your dad fed you after you showed interest. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. if I if I get blessed with a son, you know, I'm not gonna force football on him. I'm sure he's gonna be interested. His dad's gonna be a coach. Yeah. Like, you know, but you know, until he shows me that, yeah, I wanna be great. When he give me that, I'm gonna give him everything. Yeah. If he doesn't, hey man, be a great student. You know, be nice, be nice to the women, you know, bring home a nice girlfriend, you know, <laughs> you know, right? Yeah. Do things a kid will do. Go go make mistakes, dad will be here. You know yeah. what I'm saying? Like it's just like just you know, just just live, live and mm-hmm. enjoy life, man. I won't I won't force it on them. Cause and yeah. I think that my perspective now as a coach and as a head coach, I get it all, man. I get it all. Mm-hmm. And a lot of it is just that, you know, the parents are uninformed. And that's sort of why. You know, I created the secondary branch of my of my academy, which is pretty much all informational purposes, recruiting in terms of, you know, just going through the process, navigating through it after you get your offer. How what's the next step? You know, just all of that, man. I try yeah. to try to break it down in steps for the for the people. But some people just don't want it or they think they got it. Yep. <laughs> Absolutely. And, uh, and before any kids out there go and say, well, yeah, that's my parent, they're overbearing, you know, they, whatever, whatever, I, this is because of them. And my coach doesn't do this or that. Mm-hmm. Take that good look in the mirror because yeah. the, usually the parents overbearing because they know that you're not going to step up and take over. And if, whether you got to have a tough conversation or just flat out show them, uh, you know, start, start meditating on success, start waking yeah. up in the morning, thinking about it, going to, going to bed, thinking about it. If it's not the case, what else are you good at? Like you said, you know, what else, what else are your passions? Are you going to be good in school? Um, you know, what I like to say is in a hundred years when everybody you know is gone, how's the world going to be different because of you? You know what I mean? So that's one thing to think about. That's, you know, your purpose. And for you and I, you know, we found this talent, mm-hmm. this ability to, to help guys, uh, this joy in, in bringing them along. Yep. And uh, it's very obvious to me that in a hundred years, Uh, the linemen of the world are going to be in a better place, you know, because of guys like you and I and what you're doing out there is, is really special. Um, When it comes to your, your academy, your coaching, your, your career, 
what's your what would be your new dream now? I mean, it used to be you want to play in the uh, NFL, uh, and then what's your dream now? Uh to uh to coach in the NFL. To coach, yeah. coach high level football. To coach yeah. in the NFL, coach in college. You know, and it's it, it, it's more of a it, it's it's not even more of a more of a the dream is it's different. You know, and you know what I'm saying that the, the hunger and thirst for it, like how it was when we were kids, is different now. Mm-hmm. And you know what? I'm going to tell you my, my overall dream. Of course, I want to get there. I just want to wake up every day. I'm a football coach. Mm. I'm a football coach. But, you mm. know, and, 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 fo- and football, football pays the bills. Football keeps me looking good. You know, right? Yep. You know, it's just, it takes football, it takes care of me. We put so yep. much into the game, man. Game, game saved my life. You know, yeah. and I, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm giving back to it now. I think that, um, it's beautiful. you know, I'm a, I'm a dean at the high school that I coach at now, and I enjoy that. Not as much as I being a, being a football coach, though. You know, I, some, I'd be a, something yeah, I'd about be a, normal students ain't quite like football players. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 you're exactly right. Yeah, you're exactly right. I mean, it's, it's a good job, and I, I, I enjoy being able to connect with the students, but I know that. When you find your purpose in this world and you find what what gets you excited to wake up, you need to do it. You know, yeah. that, and, and and me, you know, me being able, being 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 sick and being held back from the game for so long. And now it's like it's crazy because now it's like it's that feeling all over again. Now it's just like, man, I can't wait to to somebody's like, hey coach, the O line ready today? What you mean are the O line <laughs> ready? What? Of course, of course. I'm one, yeah. I'm all right, shorts, shorts. Walking in there, Nike, you know, we, we, we all good. Just, just relax. And that's, that's my vision. That's the dream for me. Now I, I, I sit here and I daydream and I'm an old line coach. I just walked into the, my, my meeting room after practice. I turn on some tape. I'm good. Order me a little food, watch some film, get ready for this Saturday. Now get ready that's to great. roll. Like, yeah, yeah, that's, yeah. that's, that's what I, that's what I plan on doing for a long time, you know, and I know you. I know yours got to be similar because it's just it's it's nothing like it, man. Nothing, nothing, nothing gets me more excited, and and nothing that I I, I know I know I'm gonna go hard. They're gonna get all of me, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yep. I'm gonna get it, get it out of me because that's what I want to do. That's fantastic. No, I love that. For me, uh, it's I'm, uh, it's it's more of almost a fallback to go back to coaching for teams yeah. more, even though I yeah. love it. Uh, especially at a high level would be amazing to work with professionals, you know, yeah. because you don't have yeah. to babysit at all. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> right. You know, to deal with, the, you know, it's tough, man. It's, it's soul sucking to have to deal with guys that don't want to be there. I mean, it's yeah. just, it's, yeah. But, uh, but, you know, and God bless you for doing that, you know, for being a head coach and dealing with the politics and parents and all that, all the logistics. I could, yeah. I, I really honestly could not do it. That got and, you. <laughs> I could, you know, trying to do the business side of things is even tough. I have a postcard on my desk that just says I handwritten. All I have to do is football. All I have to do is football. focus on the football. And that's why I got the you know, producer, uh, you know, things when you, when you focus on your number one, uh, the path falls into your lap, you know? Mm-hmm. And so I think that's really big, but, uh, so let's wrap this up because we're going to come back on, um, you know, regularly, we're going to dig into football and stuff. Yeah. But uh, but I think we can wrap with uh, with what is your favorite thing about the line play, lineman, mm-hmm. the line mentality, being a lineman, coaching lineman, what have you? Oh man! Well, well before we go there, you got to screenshot that because I I need to see that image. That's gonna be my new iPhone lock screen. I like it. All right, football every day because I I know yeah you know I'm I'm big in affirmations, big in meditation. Yeah, you definitely got to send me that. I have terrible That's, handwriting, so I have to <laughs> right. get somebody to write a new one for you. Right, I got you. But uh, line play, man. Um, I enjoy it. Warfare, the trenches. It's the it's the it reminds me of a mental battle every day. Now that I'm older, it reminds me of you know you you wake up and you make a decision to be positive or negative. Now it's just it's such a, so many life lessons learned in the trenches, you know, because you you know you you got that. Like I I talk to my I joke with my assistant coaches all the time. It, you always remember one player who made you elevate. Mm. You got on that field and you you thought you were bad shit and you saw that one guy and he made you elevate and you're like you hit that guy and you're like fuck I can't bark him. <laughs> I can't, he's not moving. Nothing I'm doing is working. Why is he beating me like this? You, you can't fathom it. Mm-hmm. I, I had that moment as a junior at Mount Carmel. And, and you know, and it's, it's, it's crazy because it's, 
I, I literally sat there and I'm like, I'm good. I'm a good player. Why is this happening? Right? You know, you're 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 almost baffled. It, it it forces you to it forces you to dig deep. Forces you to find alternatives. I think that the life component of line play is huge for me, man. It's huge. Just the mm-hmm. the, the mental battles. The you have to be perfect and technique sound and aggressive as shit and on point precise every play at full speed yes like yeah you and you get a you get a chance to move a man against his will like you mm-hmm. know i never saw o-line play as a as sort of a defensive position i saw it as uh, the aggressor all the time yeah. the, always the aggressor you know now you know I, that's why i teach my o-line and now i said that's because those guys on defense that don't mean they're tough you know, hit them, hit them in their shit. They didn't find out what it is, you know? Yeah, and it's just like life. I said, you get hit in the mouth. You get hit in the mouth. Then you respond. Like, it's like, I know you went against a guy and somebody probably hyped him up. You know, like, oh, that guy's good, Alex, man. Hey, hey, you better work this week. That guy's good. And then you hit him and you're like, oh, he's not. He don't have it. I, I love it. I love the one-on-one battle. Like the the you you go against a guy and it's like yeah I'm bringing I'm bringing you hit him like I tell him like, the first first drive first series you come off the ball that first inside zone boom it's like yeah I'm gonna be here all fucking game <laughs> all game what's up like yeah yeah, yeah. you know and that's that's what in terms of me that's what I miss I miss that battle I miss I miss working hard and being in the weight room and then I get to go at it we get yeah. to go I'm gonna find out that if you work just as hard in the off season and if you care just as much as me. Line play, because it, it, we, we all going to get beat up. We all going to get hurt. We're going to get banged up. We're going to get tired, man. But it, it comes down to that, that one-on-one battle. And it's so mental. The shit, when you're tired and you're like, whoo, man, <laughs> right, right. Yeah. Coach calls zone, and you're like, man, I do want to run zone. My leg's a little sore now, coach. But, yeah, <laughs> yeah you got to figure it out. You know, and I, and I, I, I challenge my guys that because in, in life, you got to figure it out. Yeah. The shit, when you get hit with – with with uh with different things that that sort of you get hit with life and life's looking at you like oh what you got now you know you you gotta you gotta take that same mentality into it man so you know that's why being a line coach is is special for me special because I get a chance to you know to, to share to share my my experiences and passions with the guys because I know that you know especially the new the younger guys I be talking about it so much and I take it so personally they be like oh coach you want to play still hell yeah I want to play you know, right? <laughs> right I wish I could go out there with you I wish mm-hmm. I could against that guy with you but you know because I, I just want them to you know because I feel like that was uh the biggest thing that uh that coach Rochard he always talked about it. he said when I watch a guy on film I want to see his pride and I was like, what? You know, I, you know, I want to see his pride. I want to see if he cares about winning that block. If he, the guy who he's blocking should not touch anybody with the ball. He cares that much, but he won't give anything up. And I'm, you know, now that I'm looking at it, you know, that, that's, that's sort of my, well, I know you touched on philosophy earlier. That's sort of my philosophy. You know, that, that's the type of guy I want that want to, mm-hmm. to, to, to overcome it. Even when you're tired, even when it's late in the game, you know, just, different things like that. That's what I love. What about you? Man. Oh man. That was, that was great. You know, for me, uh, I think the less, like you, like you're saying, you know, all you said a number of things, all of those, mm-hmm. but, uh, but absolutely the lessons in friendship, uh, teamwork, yep. leadership, uh, for me, I look back and, uh, the situations that football put me in made me the, per- the adult that I am. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? Like you, you learn a lot about yourself. And like you said, it's not what, happens it's how you react yep and um so i learned a lot about uh, keeping your head and and thinking a couple steps ahead you know for me it was all about tactics mm-hmm. um yep and, and and more you know like i love that show your pride you know and i and i think of all the players and, and all the plays that i had and all the situations and all the players i played with and all the players i've coached uh when they when they really showed that and and then you think of the guys who lack that Yep. And, um, and so it, it really is the line in, in, the, in, in, the, in the A and B offensive lineman, the guy who makes it, the guy who doesn't. Yeah. And show your pride in between those whistles, man. Yeah. And it's, uh, you don't have to be a mean guy. I was a nice mm-hmm. guy. You, right. don't even, you don't even have to talk crap. No. You know, guys right. can respect you more for what you do with your pads than what you do with exactly. your lips, you know. So, um, so all of that. And then and as a coach, um, you know, it, it could have been any game, any situation, you know, but, but football and line play specifically, 
is a, is a really special uh, opportunity to help guys along, to help yeah. guys grow in confidence, to help guys uh, d- develop a vision for what they want for their life, and, uh, and just to help guys in general grow uh, quickly, mature, and, uh, and accomplish for themselves the things they set out to accomplish. Um, I think it's a beautiful thing. And then, and then just, you know, in today's social media bullying world, you know, to grow, uh, to have lifelong friends that you've been through it with, yep. uh, to put, all, put it all on the line with guys, to have each other's back and, uh, and learn how to overcome the ego that only the only position on the field that uh, you have to learn to overcome the ego. Yeah. You can't get away with it is that O-line because it, it's so obvious if you don't. So um, I just think it's a beautiful thing. When I go to a seven on seven tournament, which I just don't do very often, um, it hurts my heart. It hurts my heart to be there and to see a football field without linemen, not only because of the X's and O's and the, and the you know, line play, but because of the, the atmosphere, the attitude, and the, um, just that lack of, of modesty yeah. uh, and just mm-hmm. uh, confidence rather than, uh, you know, coolness and flash mm-hmm. and all this stuff. So I always say that, that that's a huge uh, thing that's lacking from those tournaments and seven on seven is, is all that, that big ego and flash and, and yeah. backflips. And, you know, it's great, but um, it's really hard to get the glory and to get the touchdowns and to, and to be without that ego in a way that you can – uh, you know, help the guy who needs it on the, on the team notice, you know, and, and, and uh, just be there for each other. It's really tough when you're the, the guy in the limelight. So I love that part of it is that, uh, that egoless uh, for the team yep. uh, group atmosphere approach, and then putting in the work in and putting results. You can't, you can't, you can't fake it. Yeah, man. Yeah. Like you said, being a lineman, it forces you to count on a guy next to you. You, whether you want to or not, yep. you have to. Like, and, and you realize that the stronger you guys' relationship is, the better you play. Like, mm-hmm. it, it, like the stronger, the more that you pay attention to how he moves and how he works and you sort of – you guys are in sync, it works better. So I, yeah. I agree 100%. It, it's a brotherhood, man. It's Absolutely. a brotherhood. We're fist. You know, right, we, we got one guy that's a stud and then we got four average guys – and uh, the stud thinks he's better than everybody. Doesn't want to work. You got to average your line, damn the yep. bar. You know, so yep. you know, I I talk to my guys about that all the time, man. So I just talk to them about, and that's the that's the the root of it. You know, mm-hmm. at the end of the day, we, we're working for each other. You know, we're we're working together, and you know, are we're going to fight together. You know, we ain't leaving nobody out. This dog fight, we're all in it, and we all gonna pick each other up. Somebody fails, we are gonna pick them up. I love it. There's a ton of value there for guys. Might have to split it into two episodes itself. We'll see. But uh, how can people find you? Let's say that they're in Chicago for one and they're in the area, they can come train. And then also people just online who want to keep an eye for more videos and stuff coming from you. Oh, yeah. Well, uh, online on Twitter, uh, guys can follow me at CoachLA73. You know, I'm always dropping O-line stuff. You know, uh, probably the newest thing that I'm dropping is just, uh, you know, a uh, board talk talk series you know so I, i've been going over inside zone lately you know I'm, i'll switch over to power different things like that different topics protections i'm sure we'll collab on a lot of those things and then on on facebook they can uh find me they can search arthur ray's lineman academy you know I always got a bunch of videos i'm always even college videos nfl videos we're just breaking things down so you know i'm looking forward to it man i'm looking forward to keep keep doing videos like this with you yep absolutely no we'll uh We'll get on the drawing board and, and really uh, and try to bring some value. We've got a cool opportunity to, to help the next generation. So we'll get that going. But uh, for all you viewers out there, we appreciate you guys listening and watching. And uh, make sure you jump online and follow Coach LA. Uh, obviously, get on all of it, Instagram, Facebook, the whole the – whole. are you on Instagram too? Yeah, yeah. It's Coach LA 73 on Instagram as well, same as Twitter. Perfect. All right. I know those kids like that Instagram. So very good. For all you linemen out there, keep working hard, guys. Make all your blocks, keep in that weight room, uh, and don't worry too much about recruiting too early, and uh, make sure you want it more than your parents, nope. and, uh, <laughs> and keep watching Line Pro Materials and also Coach LA over there, and we'll see you guys next time on Line Mentality by Line Pro.